thank you. Any luck, Jason, or no? We good? All right, hold on, hold on. Uh, Chris, can I have you turn those side lights off right there? They're switching out associate fluorescent lights. All right. So I learned something this past week, and I'm going to take you back in time. I actually learned it almost a week and a half ago. I know, right? I'm making stuff up. And I learned that laughter is something that helps us to learn. And the, there are times where if we can just find a way to laugh, that we're actually putting ourselves in a position to learn. <laughs> 20 years ago, I started preaching, and I would preach to a room of about 12 people. There would be seven girls and five guys. And the seven girls were, for many of them, had struggles in their lives. Uh, they either had a baby out of wedlock, or they'd been through a divorce, or um, just sometimes they wanted to, be, to, to get to know Christ closer. And then for the guys, they had never had a date in their lives. And so they were wanting me to fix them up with these girls that were looking to be spiritual, and on the guys, so they're something. Now, there was two couples that were in the class, though, that were both single. And so eventually what happened in the class was those two couples got married, and then they graduated to this next class called Partners. And so when they were gone, like every week was get me a date, and from the girls it was completely, tell those guys to leave me alone. So for those of you who remember the dating game, to the guys I was Chuck Woolery, and for those of you guys who remember this guy, to the women I was Chuck Swindoll. So I had everything covered back and forth. Well, one day I had to go upstairs to preach, and what happened was it was a time change, and we went from this class of, you know, 12 people, and I didn't know this, but when I went upstairs, there were a couple hundred people like it is now, and I had never preached before in front of that many people. So I did, as probably any of us would do, I panicked, and I spoke 100 miles an hour, which I'm still doing to this day. I can get a four-hour message in 40 minutes, so you're welcome. And... <laughs> What I learned that day was that you, you always, in your mind, you have to be prepared because you never know when something's going to come up that, that you, you're going to be thrown into. And so that day I preached when I got done. Uh, there was people that came up and, oh, you know, thanks for preaching today and I appreciate that and what a good message. And then the, the guy that was supposed to preach but had not set his clock ahead or behind or whatever it was that you fall behind and came up and he said, hey, you know, good job as far as preaching. And there was this one couple and they stopped me and the guy said to me, preaching is not about making people laugh. And you shouldn't just get up there and tell jokes. Anybody can do that. To which I responded with, well, you couldn't do that. <laughs> and I did what you just did. I laughed and I laughed and I laughed. And so it's difficult because at times we, we come here and... and we, we get together and we think, okay, well, there's, is there some entertainment in it when I come to learn about God's Word? Should I, is it okay to laugh at times? Is it okay to have some fun? And we absolutely should. The laughter actually helps us to, to learn. So I'm, I'm going to show you some things this week that when I saw them, some of them, they just made me laugh. Some were so stupid, I didn't care. But they, they I had an out. So, so go ahead, Jason, show the first one. I don't know if you can read that. Here's a kid, and the, he's, putting a, a, he's putting a knife into a, an outlet, and it says at the top, this kid's going places. Not college, but places. <laughs> See, I thought that was so fun. I'm still laughing about this. <laughs> now I'm starting to worry about my sense of humor. All right, go to the next one. All right, this one Sean Snyder posted. Glenn Moats, by the way, posted that last one. I thought it was great. This one Sean posted. It says, this is Jesus and he's preaching. And he says, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. And then someone says, but Jesus, what about if they're Muslim? And then Jesus says, okay, I'm going to start over from the beginning. Let me know where I lost you. <laughs> it's okay, good. So now we're on the same. All right, good. Whew, I was a little worried. Rough room. Go ahead. This one is uh, Frosty, and it says celery, carrots. He's standing in front of the carrots. Says, Frosty gets caught picking his nose. <laughs> Come on, Klein. That was hilarious. Golly. All right. How many teachers here? This is why science teachers should not be given playground duty. <laughs> Some of you right now, I'm good, man. Okay, here we go. Next one. All right, this is just for, this is a modern day one. It says, that's right, you either pull up your pants 
or you wear the underwear or underpants I made you out of jeans. <laughs> and all of you are like, where can I buy those? Are those on sale on Black Friday? So we can get those to people. All right, get, here we go. Sorry, son, there's no app for that. <laughs> yeah. And I think it's the last one. This is the last one? One more. Oh, this is really tough to read. I don't want to put this in braille. So these are two, like, cell phones, and they're going to an old phone that's got the wire on it. And he says, yeah, that's right, our ancestors had tails. <laughs> is that the last one, Jason? Oh, last one is two ladies. Two women says, nice purse. Okay, I don't read that one. <laughs> All right, there we go. So we, we need to be able to have this ability at times just to laugh a little bit because it opens our minds and our hearts so that we can learn more. And so in this time of, of laughing, we all found something, hopefully, that we could laugh add a laugh about. There had to be something that reaches us. And so when we come in each week, we hear about God's Word. We first of all want to understand how it is that it's relevant, but then to prepare ourselves to learn. And so when you come and you sit down, the hope is, okay, we're, we're spending this time together. We're having this conversation. We're having this discussion. And how is it that I can relate God's Word to me? So that's why we decided a few weeks ago to dive into the book of Philippians. And we've never done this before. And we're going through it Chapter by chapter. Now, we're not breaking it down verse by verse because we'd be here for a long time, but we chose to do the book of Philippians for this reason. Paul was in jail, and in jail, he was chained to a sweaty, big-time guard 24-7, and every six hours, this guy would change. And so, this guy comes in, and the next guy gets chained to him, gets chained to him, then six hours later, the next guy gets chained to him. And so Paul has to make the decision as to how he wants to treat the circumstances in his life. And so Paul made the choice that he was going to do whatever he could to share the gospel with the person that was chained with him. And so to the point that when he was writing, that it said the entire palace guard, everybody in the palace knew of who Paul was and what it was that Paul stood for. And yet here he is heading to a trial that's probably going to lead to his execution. It's probably going to be done for Paul, but he still made this choice of this is the life that I'm going to live, and I'm living it because it's way bigger than me. And so each week, he, or each day, he is talking to this guy and reaching out to the next guy, but while he's doing this, he's also writing a letter. And he's writing this letter to the church of Philippi. Philippi was a city named for Alexander the Great's father, Philip. And the reason it was named for him is because this was a great place and Alexander thought the world of his dad and he wanted to honor his dad. But for the Romans, the Romans had a big fight and Brutus, the guy that stabbed Caesar, they had to leave because they lost that battle. So they sent them to the city and they had to go. So if you were on Brutus' side, you would have to leave. And so if there was some kind of little civil war kind of thing that takes on, and you know, we have churches that break up, we have countries that break up, we have states that, that, that get it on, on two different sides. At some point, sometimes, somebody was forced to go somewhere else. And if you were forced to leave your home, and to leave your city, and to leave your community, and to move literally hundreds of miles away, how would that make you feel? Well, Paul knows that for a lot of these people, that the way that they're feeling is a struggle for them. Because they don't want to live in this place. They don't want to be there. But because of this war that took place, they have to be there. But the amazing thing is, is that in this city, this city of Philippi, is the first European Christian church. And so Paul had planted it there. And so he knows that they have hope. And he wants them to know that they have this hope. And yet, if they look at his life and what he's doing, how is it that you chained to this guy? How is it that you chained to someone and knowing you could be walking to your death? How is it that you are sharing hope with others knowing how poor your situation is? And so that first week we talked about, we need to have that simple mind. Because for all of us, there's something that chains us down. There's something that we feel chained to. There's something that we can't break free of. And yet God can handle all those things. And so our mind needs to be simple enough that we can see God within those circumstances. And then last week we talked about it and said, okay, if we have a simple mind to start with, we also have to have an understanding that we have to be submitted. And we have to submit to certain things. Now that's a tough word because whenever we hear submission, you need to submit, you need to submit, you need to submit. Nobody wants to hear that. But Paul, once again chained up, said this is where we need to get to next because when Jesus gave, Jesus gave all. He poured himself out completely. He sacrificed himself completely. When God gave, he gave his one and only son. So it was that submission that took place that God gives the example. And so here we are in week three, we're in chapter three, and this next step talks about being selfless. Less of ourselves. 
Because too many times, especially when it comes to Christmas, see, the Christmas season, who does it come about? Ourselves. When you were a little kid, how many times did you go, I want, I want, I want this. I want this for Christmas. I want this for Christmas. I want this for Christmas. Kids right now, when it's coming to Christmas, what are you thinking about? I want this. I want this. I want this. I want that. I want that. And all the Black Friday sales come out. How many people went shopping on Black Friday? Okay. How many people went shopping on Charcoal Thursday? <laughs> Charcoal Gray Thursday? Did you get it? Black. Okay, here we go. Z. I know, it's just a bad joke, but I got a lot of them. Stick with me here, okay? <laughs> be honest with you. Who went, who went uh, shopping on Charcoal Gray Thursday? Okay, that, we call that Thanksgiving. Just so you know, your call though, I get it, alright? The trip fan kicks in and the husbands are watching football, so we go shopping. But it's all about the deals that we can get because what our kids want and what we want and what we want and this is the most selfish time of the year whether we're not re we realize it or not except for people that are ending or nearing the end of their lives because for those that know that the time is coming up and they know that they really don't want to live through the holidays and people feel this they get this depression inside of them they have anxiety about different things there's worries that take place Sometimes to the point of, of having a decision to take their own lives during this darkest time of the year. For others, they're sick and they may be in hospice. They don't want to die on Thanksgiving and they don't want to die at Christmas. So they want to, to, to do enough in between the two so that their families will not think about those losses during that Christmas season and during that Thanksgiving season. And so this is a rough time because they... Some of you say, well, that's a selfish act, but actually it's a selfless act because they don't want it to be about them. And so in our lives, there's areas that for each one of us, we want to dive in, and we look at it and we're like, I know that I'm selfish in that area. But for others of us, we don't want to admit that we're selfish in those areas. And so we need to take a look at ourselves and say, okay, are we being like Paul? Are we leading an example like Paul? Because for Paul's life, he's not getting out of prison anytime soon. For Paul's life, he's heading to trial, and he knows it's going to lead to his death. <coughs> and none of us here are chained. To a prison guard. And none of us here know that the end is coming very, very soon. And we have to make the choice to live in such a way that even if that were to happen, that it wouldn't be about us. It would be about a loving Savior and a loving God. If I said the name Catherine Lanigan to you, many of you would not even know who that is. And yet Catherine Lanigan, when she was in college, she went to Oberlin College, and she was chosen out of all of the entire freshman class to be in an honors writing class. And so here she was, 17 years of age, and she got to be a part of this class. And what had happened was there was a professor from Harvard who would come in, and this professor at Harvard was only going to be there for six months. And they said, listen, th this time is going to be the most important class ever at this college. This guy is going to teach this class. It was a creative writing class. And you, Catherine, as a freshman, get to be in here where every other student is a senior. And she was so excited. And so she had to write a brief paper. And in that brief paper, the, the instructor got to read it so that he could understand the writing styles and how good the writers were. And so they all wrote their papers. But before the next class, she got a note that said, come and see this professor in his, in his office. So she went in, and she was just a small girl, and he was a huge, hulking man. He was over six feet, six inches tall. He had the, the, the uh, Harvard jacket on, the tweed with the elbow patches and all that stuff, and he held his folder, her folder in his hand, and when he turned around, he took the folder and slammed it down the desk, and it shot all the way across and landed in her lap. And he looked at her, and he said, your writing stinks. And she'd never been told that. And so she sat and looked at him, and she was like, what do I do? And she did everything she could because she was in so much shock, she wanted to cry. And she was in so much shock that when she stopped for a moment, instead of crying, there were no tears because she was in literally in fear of this big, hulking man who had said to her the one thing that she'd never heard in her life. And so she has to make a decision. But before she could make this decision, she decided to say these words. What is it that is wrong with my writing? And he started going through a list, a laundry list. This is bad, and this is bad, and this is bad. And she said, is there anything in there that's good at all? Is there any glimmer of hope? And he said, well, you, your characters are okay, and you can kind of write a little bit about a char your characters. But other than that, it's terrible. 
and you're wasting your time in my class and I don't even know why they chose you. He said, but I'll make you a deal. Your goal, your goal is to be a summa cum laude student. And that means for every class that you have, you have to get an A, except for one, you can get one B. And I will give you that one B as long as you promise to never, ever, ever write again. What would you do? Is she changed at this point? Does it seem like there's any way out? You're 17 years of age and you have a full scholarship to a prestigious college that's in an honors program and you're allowed one B during your college career because you have to finish high enough to get that summa cum laude and that was your goal and that's what was written to you. What would you do at that point? You're 17 years of age. Now, some of us, we think back to 17 and, and we wish that we would have stood up and said, you know what? I'll take my chances. For the others of us, we sit back and like, man, if I'm 17 and I'm going that, I've got a free ride to college, I'm taking the free ride. And for others still, we have no idea what we would do. Young students that are here now, what is it that you would do? Because your dream, the only thing that you've ever had that you want to do in your life is to write. And in your first opportunity before the greatest teacher in the area, before the greatest instructor, he has just torn you down. He's just beaten you up to the point to where you feel as though you have nothing. And every dream that you ever had has been dashed. What would you do? Paul's writing to us in chapter 3 of Philippians. And he starts off by saying, Finally, my brothers, and you would think that this is going to be the last chapter that he's writing, but there's actually a turn that takes place. Remember that when the Bible is written, that we put the chapters in. So Paul, when he's writing, Finally, my brothers, this is actually the second half of the letter. He is obviously a preacher because he said, Hey, you think it's going to be over soon? And yet there's a whole other chapter coming. So Paul writes, he says, Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you is no trouble to me and is safe for you. So when Paul is writing, he wants to remind them that you're in a safe place. As in the church, you are in a safe place. Here on Sunday mornings, we are in a safe place where we can talk about God. We can have a discussion about God. We can read from his letter. We can read from this book. But when we walk out and we're in our mission field, the world isn't the same, is it? It's not as safe. And so it takes courage to be able to stand up and to walk fearlessly. It takes courage in our classrooms. It takes courage in our sports practices. It takes courage whether we're in music or in drama, whatever it may be that we choose to do. It takes courage in our workplaces. It takes courage in whatever position God has put us in. It takes courage in our homes. As spouses, as parents, as grandparents. It takes courage to make that decision to take God with us wherever it is that we go. And so when Paul's writing, he's saying, hey, this is safe for you. For right now, this should be safe for you. But remember again, Paul's chained. Paul's not getting out. He's chained to a sweaty, big old guard, and there's not a lot of hope. And yet he's still able to find hope through it. Now, Paul gives a little resume at this point. He tells all the things that he's done, where he's from, everything about him, and why it is that he's in jail. But he picks up in verse 8. And this is what speaks to many of us when it comes to our faith. He says, Indeed, I count everything as lost because of the surpassing worth of knowing Jesus Christ, my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish, in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes from the faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. And we read through that, there are terms in there that stops us when it comes to living our faith. I count everything as a loss. We all heard that. I suffered the loss of all things. Wait a second. I have to get rid of everything? I do not have any righteousness of my own. It's not about me. So I, basically, me as a person is gone. And I may share these sufferings becoming like him in his death. And that's where too many of us stop when it comes to our Christian walk. Because we live the death of this world and we show no one the life that is offered beyond it. 
And I will guarantee each one of you today, tomorrow, and every day to come between now and Christmas and every day after that, God is going to place someone in your life that you have the opportunity to be a light to. And it may be the person that is sitting next to you right now. Young people, it may be the brother and sister that you put down with your words. And you think it's not a big deal. And yet it hurts them deeply. Husband or wife, you may think that, oh, you know what, what's a big deal if I just, if I poke some fun or I make some fun in front of the kids to get my way because I know that they'll give in. Parents, grandparents, and this is a big one that we tend to all do. If I can just use a little, enough guilt, enough guilt to get my way. And all of those acts are very selfish. And all of those acts lead to the death of a person as they die one step at a time. And they don't look at those dreams that they have. And they don't have the people in place to turn to when they want to share those dreams. And even more so to live those dreams. And for us as believers, to live like this life isn't all there is, because it isn't. Instead, Paul says that by any means possible, I may, may attain the resurrection from the dead, because he is living his faith. And that's a promise we all have. This is temporary. This is just a pause. This is just a blip in time. Are you acting like it? Are you living it? Are you giving that hope to others? Can they see a light in you? Because here it's safe and here it's easy. But today when it's 5 p.m. and it starts to get dark and we're tired and we're worn out and this week after school when we're beaten up and we just want to sit down and throw our feet up and that there are those little ones wanting to run around and play or those teenagers that want to run around and play or those teenagers that just want to sit and talk or you as a parent need to pull them in so that you can have those conversations and they feel like they're on their back even though one day they'll know that you have their back? Do we take those moments to live that faith? Because if we're not living in our homes, how in the world are we going to live in anywhere else? That's a tough question to answer. But it's one that we need to face. Because that darkness that's all around us is everywhere. And it starts in our kitchen, and in our living room, and in our dining room, and in our homes and in our schools, in our communities, and in our workplace. But isn't it amazing when you see that one person that is that light and how attracted you are to it? What is it that we do to become more like that person? And that's why when Paul is writing here, he is sharing every, with every person in the church of Philippi, I have hope. What do you mean you have hope? You're tied to a prison guard. I have hope. What do you mean you have hope? You're walking to your death. I have hope because this life isn't the end. And that's where the story turns with Paul. Not, not that I, starting in verse 12, says, have already obtained this, or I'm already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider what I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. Too often we get stuck in the past. I get so stuck in what was behind that I can't move forward. I get so stuck in the mistakes that I made. I get so stuck in my past struggles. I get so stuck in that, oh, I used to be the guy with the potty mouth. I used to be the guy that was leading the party. I was the guy that, hey, we need to go to happy hour. I was that guy. And they're all going to know that I was that guy. Paul used to be Saul. And his resume that he shared a little bit ago is he used to go into home churches to find people that were learning about Jesus Christ and he would grab them by the throat or by their shoulders and pull them outside of the house and beat them in front of those other Christians to the point where they were just enough of them alive and then basically said, make sure you tell all your friends because I'm coming for them next. I'm pretty sure none of us have done that. But when he made a change, he made a decision to make a change and not just for a day and not just for a week, but he chose to make a change for a lifetime. And when you choose to make that change, do you choose to make that change for a lifetime? As a teacher, 
as a coach, as an instructor, as an everyday person, as a blue-collar guy, as a white-collar person? Do you choose to make that change to see that light, to be that light so that others can see that in you? Because once again, we're not chained to a big old sweaty guard. And none of us are walking to our execution at any given moment. At least not that we're aware of. It continues and he says, But this one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal of the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Now, Paul is writing and he's comparing this to the Greek games. So in the Greek games, a lot of it was done. There was different running events. The first marathon that was ever run was run into Greece. And so there's a seat that the judge would sit on. It's called the Bama. And where that seat stands, there would be a judge upon that. And as they ran across, the judge would say, that guy finished first, that guy finished second, that guy finished third. And then all the runner, other runners that came in, okay, that's fine. They can cross. That, that, that's up to them. So every day, what Paul is saying is that I am going for the prize. I'm going for the greatest of all the prizes because I have that greatest prize in me. And when we accept Christ, we have that greatest prize in us. If you have the greatest story ever told, if you have the greatest prize in you, why is it that we never share it with anybody? Think about your kids when they win a tournament. When they get that trophy and how excited they are to hold that trophy up. When they get chosen for all conference, they get chosen, or they make first chair, whatever I mean, when they have that prize that they have, that certificate, that medal, that trophy, they're so proud of that. This is why, for me personally, I don't like participation trophies. Everyone gets a trophy. Everyone gets a trophy. Well, okay, then why are we keeping score? Right? If everyone's going to, let's just not keep score. There's a commercial that's out right now, the Kia thing, and he looks down and he's like, we won every game, and it says participation. And then dad takes the thing and flicks it off, and he writes champs on it. He goes, there you go, kid. We're all participating, but are we running in such a way that there's a prize at the end? How are you running the race? Because you know what? It's dark right now. We get tired right now. Let's run the race in such a way that there is a prize at the end and there is a victory at the end. You've already won when you've accepted him. It's in you. Is it coming out of you to show others? Paul continues and he says this, Let those of us who are mature Think this way, and if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. Listen to this verse. That those of us who are mature, now some of you don't think of yourself as mature, right? How many people have been a believer for at least five years? Okay, welcome to kindergarten, right? Keep your hands up, what? Keep those hands up. How many of you have been a believer for at least 10 years? 15 years? 20 years? There's a lot of mature believers in here. 25 years? So long you can't remember. <laughs> we need to be mature and we need to start acting mature in such a way that people can see that light through us. So Paul talks about that. And as he continues, he says this. Let those of us who are mature think this way and if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. Where is it you struggle? What are the chains that you have? What is this blocking you in your walk? What is it that's pulling you back? Where is it you're just treading water? What is it that's a gray issue in your life? Where is it that you're in a rut and you just can't seem to get out of it? And yet there's so many areas that you're so mature in and you know that and yet that one thing is what's holding you down. Do you give that to God? Because Paul says this, whatever it is, if you give it to him, if you talk with him about it, if you converse with him about it, if you have this conversation with him about it, he will reveal that to you. It's up to you what you do with it. A mature believer will say, I need to learn in that area. I need to work on that area. I need to focus upon that because I don't want this to come between me and anyone else. No matter who it is that God's bringing in my life. Paul continues and he says this. Only let us hold true to what we have attained. Once again, you've already won. As a believer, you already know that heaven awaits you. Do you act like that daily? Do you walk around with a smile on your face? Do you make eye contact with people 
even when it's crazy Black Friday and there's 7,000 people and there's one, one item left? Let me ask you a question. It's Black Friday sale and there's one iPad to go and you get your hands on it and you turn around and there's 20 people waiting for that last iPad. You give it away. Magic goes, no. <laughs> Who would give it away? Me neither. Okay. <laughs> Come on, most of you wouldn't, right? But think about this for a second. That's a tough spot to be in, isn't it? Oh, I was all good with the whole, yeah, I'm going to be a light and all that stuff. Wait, 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 hold on. You want me to give away an iPad? iPad? Are you serious? There's that block. If you're all afraid about what it is and that thing that's keeping you too selfish, we found it. God revealed it. There it is. Paul continues, says, Brothers, join in imitating me and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. For many of whom I have often told you and now tell you, even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Brothers, join in imitating me. Would others imitate you in your walk? If they looked at you and how it is that you walk day by day, would you want to? Would you be someone that they're like, I want to be like that guy? Let's hit the pause button for a second. Who is it in your life that you're like, I want to be more like that guy or that gal? And for most of you, it's going to be more like that gal. Sadly, but, but it is true. <laughs> that person that showed you their faith, that brought you to your faith, that you point back to. That every day they can find the positive in anything. I lost my arm in a battle, but I got another one. <laughs> Just a flesh wound, not a big deal. I can still wave to people with this one hand, hand, one hand. I lost my sight, I can't really see anymore, but you know what? I can still lift my voice. Oh, you know what? We went completely bankrupt because we weren't very smart with our finances, but look, we get to live with our other part of our family who has opened their doors to us. It doesn't matter what it is, they find the positive in everything. And as a mature believer, I would say to you that you would love to imitate them a little better. Would love to imitate them a little more. Because what they're finding is the light in a dark situation. And what they're showing each of us is Christ in that situation. Because Paul, in these darkest of situations, is still a light to everyone in the palace guard. And he has made a choice to keep it simple. And he has made a choice to submit to others. And he has made a choice that it's going to be less about him and more about all those that are around him. Brothers, join me in imitating me and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. For many of whom I have often told you and now tell you, even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. This affects him deeply. He's walking literally in tears saying, I cannot even believe this guy that walked away or this guy that fell away or this person that doesn't attend church anymore or whatever it may be. Why is it that they're gone? And it affects him personally is what that shows. Their end is destruction. Their God is their belly and they glory in their shame with minds set on earthly things. In other words, they're selfish. It became about themselves. It became about their headlines. It became about, hey, look at me. And they lost focus on the most important thing, which was the victory that they have in Jesus. And he ends with this. He says, but our citizenship is in heaven. In other words, this conversation we have, this is all about heaven. You think this is about here and now, but this is about eternity. Where you are now, this is just a blip. Once again, this is just a pause button. This is just temporary. Do we act like it? Do we live like it? Because this citizenship, our citizenship, your citizenship, my citizenship is in heaven. Even though I can't say citizenship. <laughs> Man, that's a tough word. We don't live here. We live here right now, but we don't live here. We live in eternity. You're living there now. But you have to show that light to others before you're ever going to get there. Your job and my job is to be a light. Your job and my job is to be a hope. Your job and my job is to smile through the most difficult of all the situations. And that person that I just reminded you about, that's the person you would turn to when it gets dark. But do your words show Christ in a dark time? 
Your actions show Christ through a loss, through financial ruin, through the loss of a loved one, through somebody that just up and decided just to leave. Because that's life. And that hits every one of us at some point or some time. And it's at those times the most, when we are chained down the most, that others need to see that victory and that light and that hope. Paul finishes this chapter with this. He says, but our citizenship is in heaven. And from if we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like this glorious one by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. In other words, we're changing, we're trading this in. The, the, all this that we have, we're trading this in. And we get the same body that Christ has. We get this wonderful, glorified body that it doesn't matter how much we ate at Thanksgiving. It doesn't matter that we put a few pounds on since high school and beyond. It doesn't matter that we didn't grow to 6'3 or to 7'4. It doesn't matter that we got stuck at 5'2. It doesn't matter if our hair is red, our hair is full of wisdom, <laughs> or brown, or black, or if we have no hair at all. None of those things matter. Because you've already won. And we need to start walking like we're winning. And we need to start acting like there's hope. And in this darkest time of the year, we need to be that light in every moment of every day. And we do so by imitating Christ, just as Paul imitated Christ. By imitating Paul, just as Paul imitated Christ. By imitating that special person that we talked about, who through everything chose to imitate Christ. Catherine Lanigan didn't write for 14 years. And a story came up that a Hells Angels group assassinated someone down in Texas. And so she wanted to be around the story. And so she went down to where she knew all of the writers would be. And she saw all of them underneath some shade trees. And she was just going to leave because she was like, that's where all the writers are. But because she couldn't write, she made the decision to go up and at least thank them for what it is they did. So she went up and she said, hey, I know you're all white writers and you're, you're waiting for that perfect byline and that perfect story and everything about this and you're all here because of that for all of your different newspapers and all the different outlets. And I just wanted to say that what you do means the world to me because when you write, it reaches others and it cares for others and it loves others and you tell that story. And I used to be a writer once, but I'm not anymore. But I read all the stuff that you guys write. And I just want to say thanks. What a, what a great opportunity to be a light. But as she turned and walked away, one of the writers who had a cigar in his mouth said, what do you mean you used to be a writer? And she turned and she shared that first part of the story that I shared with you. And he said to her, writers write. Writers write. I want you to write a story about the stuff that's going on, and I want you to send it to me. And so she wrote a story, and she sent it to him. And he wrote her back and said, now I want you to write the story that's been on your heart for the last 14 years when you didn't write, and I want you to send that to me. Because all of her dreams that have been crushed there was this one guy that knew that she had made a deal with the devil, which is what she termed it as. He said, you write that story. <clears throat> she went and found an old typewriter, and she started writing it. And a few hundred pages later, she sent it to him, and he called her and said, I sent that to my literary agent in New York. She's calling you in a half an hour. To which the literary agent called her back in a half an hour and said, 
you have an amazing talent. Please tell me your story. And so she told the story, and every part of her being was able to come out in the story. And the agent said to her, you know, writers write, and you need to write. And this man attacked you because he saw something in you that he knew that he didn't have. And for us as believers, we get attacked because they see something in us that they don't have. And when the difficult conversations come up, it's up to us whether or not we will stand up to continue to write that story, that part of that greatest story that was ever told, the part where Paul, as a writer, chose to write. And for this young lady, this young dreamer, whose life was pretty much over, to continue to dream. And the literary agent took this manuscript and got it published. And for you and I, we know this as The Jewel of the Nile and Romancing the Stone, which became huge box office hits. Harrison Ford was in both of the movies. You guys are all going to want to go home and now and rent them because they're 80s and 90s movies. You can have some fun with your family. But because of one person, God bless you, because of one person, because of one deal, because she couldn't see outside of her own special place that she was in, that writer stopped writing. Whatever dream it is you have upon your heart, if God wants to watch over that, He will reveal that to you. But through it, your faith, your light, and your hope has got to be the central point of that story. And we as believers, and we as mature believers, need to start living in such a way that we need to show that hope and show that light to others. No matter what it is that's chaining us down, no matter what it is that we're chained to, no matter what situation it seems like we can't get through, that we look for that light, look through that palm of promise, look through the lens of eternity, knowing, knowing that Jesus Christ died on that cross for you and for me. And he gave us that hope. And he gave us that light. And it's our choice as to whether or not we will imitate him in this day. <coughs> the praise team's going to come up and they're going to play for a little bit. <coughs> Paul talks about having a conversation in this chapter. Right where you are for a little bit, I just want you to sit. I want you to just take in the music. Mike and them are going to play for a little bit. I just want you to think about everything we just talked about. I want you to think about the circumstances in your life where you have the opportunity to be that light. I want you to think about those opportunities where you can bring hope. I want you to think about whatever that one thing that is causing you to tread water, or is causing you to feel darkness, or is causing you to be darkness at this time. And I want you to offer that up. Because we're running this race together. And we need to run it in such a way that we already know we have that prize. As, as the praise team starts with just some music here for a little bit, I just want you to just close your eyes wherever you are, just to rest a little bit. You're just going to hear some music, and I'm going to have you stand. But I want you to focus upon that. Think about that conversation that we just had. Being that light in this dark world. 